Well, the farm bill still is not making much progress. What's holding it up and what are the chances it can make progress yet this year? We'll get the answers to those questions and we'll get crop reports from Southeast Iowa and Eastern Nebraska in this week's Farmer Forum. Live from the foothills of Hump Day via Farm Journal Studios, this is AgriTalk. This morning, we'll begin with a conversation with U.S. Senator Chuck Grassley of Iowa. Then it's our Farmer Forum with panelists Mitchell Hora and Greg Anderson. Directly following the news, Margie Echelkamp from The Scoop. I, the handsome newsman Davis Michelson. Now, say hello to the host of AgriTalk, Chuck Flory. All right, Davis. Hey, thank you so much. Yeah, Senator Grassley, fresh off a trip to the Iowa State Fair. Uh, might have to ask him about that. He posted a couple of pictures from the Iowa State Fair on the opening day, and and mm-hmm. we'll uh, we'll get his impression from from that. And of course, he was he spent a lot of time talking with people while at the fair, and he's out on the road doing his uh, 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 his town meetings. And the question about foreign ownership of U.S. farmland continues to come up. So okay. we're gonna get we're gonna ask mm-hmm. him about that and try to get to the yeah. bottom line on what exactly needs to be done, what should be done, what what the consequences of going too far with yep. such a policy might be. So we'll talk about all that. It, uh, in case get... for for our new listeners, um, you know, yeah, we we lean into to Senator Grassley. Uh, he's also a farmer, like an active farmer, like he comes oh, yeah. home from Washington for harvest and all this sort of. He mows his own lawn when he has yeah. time. Um, yep. dude's got a farm out just, you know, they're in, in the, what would you call it? Northeastern Iowa sort of ish. Yeah. Um, so he's a great resource. He's a great resource. Uh, that's yep. all I'm saying. No doubt. And he's got one of the coolest lawnmowers that I've ever seen. <laughs> yes. I agree with that. <laughs> Ingenuity, talk, my friend. You, you want to talk about working smarter and not harder. There it is. That's our guy. You <laughs> that's betcha. That's our guy. That's right. That's right. No, we did uh, get a little rain overnight. Lovely okay. rain. Uh, we're sitting at about 73, 75 degrees here currently. I think it's going to heat up for a couple of days here in, uh, in yeah, the Constantinople. Yeah, the warmer temperatures Midwest. are definitely on their way. We're only 71 degrees, and we've got some rain coming. Uh, it's it's going to be here before too long, but uh, tonight looks like it could be another rough night in northeast Iowa. Yeah. All right, let's get to the news. What do you got, bud? Well, I will start with the weather. The National Weather Service predicts heavy rainfall, strong winds, and coastal impacts to continue to impact Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands as Ernesto tracks northward. Meanwhile, a frontal system was lifting northward across the center of the the nation with more showers, thunderstorms, and heavy rainfall. Heat concerns continue for the southern plains, Gulf Coast, and most of Florida. Fire weather and air quality concerns linger for the Pacific Northwest. Well, I mentioned Ernesto. Tropical storm Ernesto is on the verge of becoming a dangerous hurricane as it approaches Puerto Rico and the Caribbean. Although the storm center will pass northeast of Puerto Rico, it is expected to bring 8 to 10 inches of rain, raising the risk of flash flooding and mudslides. According to the National Hurricane Center, residents are being urged to prepare for widespread power outages. Yeah, it is an active season so far. Um, Name storm number five has is rolling through. Well, according to a U.S. inflation report for July, inflationary pressure appears to be easing somewhat. The Consumer Price Index, or CPI, rose 2.9% year-on-year. The first time since March 2021, the CPI has been below 3%. Now, economists had anticipated that the annual inflation rate would remain steady at 3.0%, with core inflation slightly cooling to 3.2%. Factors contributing to the slowdown include easing costs for cars, airfare, and housing, although, Chip, auto insurance costs are expected to rise. Yeah, and the affordability issue is catching up. Therefore, it's starting to slow down some spending. But consumers continue to spend with credit, and that is a big problem. And you know what 2.9% year-on-year inflation is not? Mm. It's not 2%, which is the stated goal of the Fed. So... How is lowering interest rates going to help the Fed get to the stated interest rate, uh, interest rate, to the stated inflation goal of 2%? I don't know. There's 
there's a lot up in the air on monetary policy at this time. Well, here's an interesting little note, Chip. The Mortgage Bankers Association report a 35% increase in refinance applications last week compared to the previous week. And get this, a 118% increase compared to the same week last year. While rates only dropped one basis point last week, they've fallen by 33 basis points over the past four weeks and are 62 basis points lower than a year ago. The Port of Los Angeles saw a record volume of goods processed last month as importers rushed to bring in holiday merchandise early. The surge was driven by efforts to avoid tariffs, disruptions from Red Sea cargo diversions, and a potential strike by East and Gulf Coast dock workers in October. The soybean market in Brazil is currently experiencing lower prices, which have been somewhat mitigated by the depreciation of the Brazilian real. This depreciation was, has provided Brazilian soybean farmers with a competitive edge over their U.S. counterparts by allowing them to endure lower commodity prices more effectively, as these prices are typically denominated in dollars. If the Brazilian real were to rally, it could negatively impact Brazilian soybean producers. We've got to watch that dollar-real relationship there, Chip. Yeah, absolutely, we do. And the U.S. Department of Justice finally is considering a significant antitrust move to break up Google following a landmark court ruling that found the company monopolized the online search market. Chip? Wow. Yeah, there's a lot of people that are out there probably saying, it's about time. <laughs> and there's other people that are saying, don't hurt my Google. Yeah, not Google. <laughs> yeah. yeah, my Google. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Davis. Let's bring yeah. in Margie Echelkamp, editor of The Scoop. Good morning, Margie. Good morning, Chip. Good morning, everyone. All right. Uh, talk to me about the future of ag retail agronomy services. Yeah, well, this really got top of mind for me recently. I just attended the Fertilizer Institute's agronomy conference here in St. Louis this week. And then I also heard from head of Nutrien Retail, Jeff Tarsi there, and had also some interviews with leadership from Winfield United. And both of those really highlight these muddy boots scientists we have out in the field, the ag retail agronomist, and how their work could be transformed by technology. So agronomy has always been this balance, maybe this 50-50 toss up between being a scientist and being, being a bit of an artist, right? Mm -hmm. And while the leaders I talk to say that the top agronomists will always have to trust their gut, right? Their instincts, mm -hmm. what they know is right for a crop, what they're seeing out in the field, but very quickly, that science is going to be augmented by artificial intelligence and data-driven decisions yeah. to the yeah. point where in a very short amount of time, that 50-50 balance between art and science might be a 90-10 balance between the science and yeah. then the art. So still relying on those professionals and really what makes them so good at their jobs, but definitely being able to lean on these mounds of data and agronomic yep. insights that we've acquired. Yep, yep, yep. For those out there that are baseball fans, what we're talking about is Moneyball. And, uh, <laughs> there you go. That's a great analogy. Yeah, making sure that the money is getting spent in the right places for the biggest returns. It's... Uh, uh, it's it's going to be a challenge and need plenty of analysis going forward. Thanks, Margie. Thank you, Chip. We've got Senator Chuck Grassley from Iowa up next. In the morning, you're coffeeed up and you're thinking. In the afternoon, you've calmed down, but you're still thinking. We're here all day. Agritalk. And welcome back to Agritalk. I'm your host, Chip Flory. Davis Michelson and I welcome you back to the show. We do. Yes. And we also welcome back U.S. Senator Chuck Grassley from Iowa. Senator Grassley, welcome back to Agritalk. It's good to talk with you again. Most of the time I have this program with you, I'm in Washington, D.C., but uh, I'm in Iowa. The Senate isn't in session because of the Democratic convention next week. And we won't be in session until the Tuesday after Labor Day. 
And so I'm in Iowa holding my 99 county meetings, and I have about uh, 12 to go, and I'll finish the 99th one for the 44th year in a row uh, <laughs> next week up in northwest Iowa. That is so impressive, Senator. It it really is. I hope you understand how much everyone in Iowa appreciates the fact that you get out and you make the effort to get to each and every of the 99 counties each and every year. Um, it, it's uh, it's really a testament to to how much work you, you you put into this each and every year. So we appreciate that very much. Uh, First off, since you're back in Iowa, how's the corn and soybean crops looking? Uh, very good. It's been two weeks without a rain, but compared to last year, when during the months of uh, May to October, we only got 10 inches of rain. So far, during that same period of time up till now, mid-August, uh, we've had 25 inches that I have measured myself. Yeah, well, the good news is it looks like you've got some rain moving into the west end of your county right now. So give it a little bit of time. It'll be there before you know it, okay? <laughs> well, it'll really help the soybeans. I don't know whether the corn needs it at this point, but soybeans will fill out uh, greater if we get a few, uh, even a few tenths of an inch of rain. Yeah. I think it's going to make a big difference. Yep, yep, you're absolutely right. It sure will. Okay, let, let's talk about the Farm Bill, Senator. And, and Senator Stabenow, the chair of the Senate Ag Committee, continues to make statements that put the blame for the stalled Farm Bill on the shoulders of the of the GOP and Republicans. Have you had a chance to talk with the chairwoman about the Farm Bill here recently? Not. Uh, we, we adjourned uh, for August by one day, and so maybe two weeks uh, into July, I had a conversation with her, and it kind of went like uh, she's trying to compromise and work something out. But that was about what the compromise—that uh, was about what the conversation amounted to. Okay, we continue to look for the text from the Senate Ag Committee, and we're not getting it. Uh, what's the holdup on that? Well, the holdup is that uh, she is not willing to reflect the same 20% increase uh, in uh, support prices for uh, the commodity programs that we have, corn, soybeans, peanuts, et cetera, uh, as the House did at about 20%. And uh, we feel that that 20% is necessary uh, by... I'm saying we, meaning we Republicans, but there's at least one Democrat that has spoken out in favor of higher uh, support prices. Anyway, uh, the 20% that would represent the increase in inflation for machinery parts, biodiesel, uh, interest, seed, fertilizer, chemicals. And uh, she has suggested some increase, I think, around... Maybe it's not fair for me to, I think I heard a figure of about 5%. She might be interested in going. But that doesn't pass the holes that we have in the safety net uh, for farmers, particularly for small size farmers. Now, we got farmers that are farming 15,000, uh, 20,000 uh, acres. But for the farmer that's farming an average of 300 acres, which is the average farm in Iowa, or uh, the farmers that are farming uh, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 acres, uh, that doesn't reflect uh, the reality yeah. that when uh, natural disasters and politics and international war and international politics <clears throat> and all this stuff that affects uh, the prices of a commodity as much as overproduction does, uh, the safety net is meant to help those farmers that have nothing, that uh, have uh, no control over the environment they work in. Right, right, absolutely. That's the big reason that the safety net is there. And, and uh, 
uh, it's reason that uh, so many farmers want that looked at. So is it, it's likely that we're going I, uh, to see an extension of the two. Because maybe, yeah. I, maybe I mis, misled people. When I said there's farmers that are farming 15,000, 20,000 acres, I didn't mean to imply that all these things about politics and natural disasters and everything else didn't affect them, but they have more staying power, power than the small and medium-sized farmers have. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Okay, so is it most likely that we're going to see an extension of the 2018 bill? Yeah, within, before September 30th, and we're in yeah. three weeks during September before we adjourn October for the presidential election. I expect that uh, that we'll have a continuing resolution, and my bet is it'll be part of the continuing resolution. Okay. But we're not going to go naked for uh, not having any farm bill whatsoever. Okay. All right. Very good. Very good. Many economists have concluded that the ag economy is in a recession already. It's being reflected in job layoffs at companies like Deer, Kinsey, Bridgestone. Uh, Deer is also moving some jobs to Mexico. I've I've been I, I've gotten some pressure from listeners. They would like to hear your reaction to Deer moving some of the jobs to Mexico. What are your thoughts? Well, first of all, uh, uh, I wish John Deers didn't do that. But uh, the American worker is protected to some extent now that we have the U.S. Uh, United States Mexico Canadian agreement that certain wages that are paid have to be uh, meet a certain level and a certain amount of the workers putting together uh, manufactured uh, products, including tractors, cars, etc., have to be made with a certain percentage of American employers, mm -hmm. so uh, or employees. So that's some protection that the U.S. Mexican trade agreement gives. Uh, uh, workers that are still have jobs in the United States, but it's no, uh, what I just said can't be comforting uh, to workers that are unemployed because John Deere's is moving something to Mexico. I yeah. think for the most part, uh, you don't have entire tractors uh, coming from Mexico right. to the United States. You have parts of things that are made down there, like the recent thing I think they moved was making cabs down there. Those cabs will come back and be put on tractors in in the United States, I I have to assume. Uh, unlike cars that come in from Mexico, almost completely uh, built. Right, right. Okay. Uh, an, another issue that's coming up a lot, and, and, and just recently, farmer uh, foreign-owned farmland it sounds like that topic continues to come up as you're traveling the state how big of a problem is it and what do you think should be done well the farm bill has come up in 61 of the 80 some counties i've been in so far this year and i expect it to come up more in the 12 i have to finish uh in the meantime uh we're uh Ernst and I and Fetterman wrote a letter to the Department of Agriculture that they're not adequately keeping track of the foreign owned land in the United States, and we expect them to upgrade their statistics and records so people can go to their website and find out how much foreign land and what countries uh, own this foreign land. Now, it's probably uh, very much a minority of the total land in the United States at maybe 3% or less, uh, but I support legislation that passed the Senate last year but didn't get through the House, and I expect we'll have the same issue up again this year that Russia, China, Iran, and North Korea can't buy farmland okay. in the United States. I'm okay. for that prohibition. Excellent. Excellent. All right, Senator, thank you so much for your time again. Be safe. We'll talk to you again soon.
Uh, next, uh, talk to you anytime you want me. Goodbye. All right, U.S. Senator Chuck Grassley. Time for Markets Now with the experts from Pro Farmer. Joining us now, Pro Farmer editor Brian Grady. Beach, we've got some plus signs. We're trying to see a price recovery in these grains. Yeah, uh, haven't been able to say that in, in a while, but uh, pretty solid gains right now, six to seven cents in, in soybeans. Soy meal is also trading to the upside. Soy oil's a little bit of an anchor. It was uh, trading higher earlier on, but now it's kind of narrowly mixed here at mid-morning, and, and so uh, we'll have to see. But uh, it's just corrected buying, short covering uh, at the moment. Uh, corn market's trading about two cents higher, so it's uh, participating, and, and the wheat uh, complex is also higher. Uh, being led by uh, oh, about three to four cent gains in the front end of the SRW market. Yeah, that December corn flirting with that four dollar level. The call of four hundred three is the resistance in that market. What would it mean to you if we could get a close over four hundred three this week in these corn? Well, for the week, it, it would be pretty significant, I think, yeah. in that uh, maybe we put in a, a short-term low at that point in time. But, uh, you know, we had the key bullish reversal the other day after the report. Didn't get any follow-through yesterday. And, and so um, it, it kind of just spinning its wheels at the moment. But it, at least we have plus signs today. All right. Plus signs in the livestock trade, too. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, feeder cattle, they're trading sharply to the upside, uh, slight to moderate gains in most of the live cattle contracts. And, and uh, you know, the, the discounts to the cash index is, yeah. or the cash market is really uh, providing some support in the front end of the, uh, the live cattle market. Um, still waiting on active cash cattle trade. It's probably going to slide again this week uh, okay. after a, a notable decline last week. And then the hog futures, uh, they're trading sharply to the upside in deferred contracts today. All right. Thank you, Brian. Pro Farmer Editor Brian Grady. To get more from Pro Farmer, give it a try at tryprofarmer.com. Opinions expressed on AgriTalk do not necessarily reflect the views of Farm Journal Broadcasting, affiliate stations, or sponsors. You're listening to AgriTalk, where the conversation begins. Join us at 855-4-TALK-AG. Welcome back to AgriTalk. It is time for this week's Farmer Forum. Uh, you know, real quick, Davis, it's... Uh, oh, yep. I got to yeah. push the button sometimes. Yeah. Okay. Go on. Yeah. The hmm? foreign ownership of U.S. farmland. Yes. As the senator said, it it's not a huge amount, but it's, it's not just the amount. It's the location. Right. Yes. And the proximity to some U.S. military bases, especially when we're talking about the uh, Chinese ownership of U.S. farmland. That's yeah. the one that that has me a bit confused. Okay. Well, uh, that's that's the thing, because right. Canada, I think Germany is up there. You know, they own yep. significant stakes in U U.S. Right. land, but right. it doesn't exactly seem right. to concern us nearly as much as the Chinese. And there's a reason for that. That's right. That's right. Okay, let's get to the Farmer Forum. We've got to get Mitchell Hora to unmute and come on aboard here. Mitchell, hey, buddy, how you doing? It's good to talk with you again. I think you might be muted, Mitch. All right, we're going to work that out. We, we're still trying you to bet. get Greg. Hello? Okay. Huh? No, that was me. I said you bet. Yeah. All right. Yeah, we need to get Mitch to unmute and then uh, get Greg on the line here, too, and get him into the conversation. Um, but, I got some. Uh, yeah, oh, go what on. do you got? Well, there, there's a little uh, note here in the news that I didn't get to. Uh, the Panama Canal is reportedly struggling to regain the trust of traders in liquefied natural gas and food commodities after a historic drought last year forced significant restrictions on transit. We were watching that Panama Canal story, um, and it sounds like they've, they've got it back into a reasonable functional level here, um, and yet there's there's this uh, note of trust uh, among traders in the liquefied natural gas and food commodities yeah. of maybe not wanting to use that Panama Canal. Well, I think what they need to do is take a look at what the uh, 
what the you know what what are the conditions right now? Yeah. yeah, I saw the story that you had, and I thought to myself, wait a second. I thought the Panama Canal it may not be fully operational, but mm-hmm. it's mm-hmm. better than it was three months ago, and it's- they need to uh, they they need to make that happen. They need to make it happen. All right. We've got Greg Anderson from Eastern Nebraska on the line with us. How you doing, Greg? Hey, I'm doing great, Chip. Anytime you can see puddles in the driveway and picking up mud on country roads in mid-August, we're really thankful for that. We had a nice rain overnight. Dude, that is so unusual for the 14th of August in Eastern Nebraska. Uh, it, it, it Tell me about how the crops are looking there. Hey, you know, uh, really pretty good. And we were needing this rain. We're going to need some more rain here to finish out. But uh, this is this is uh, really puts a smile on a lot of farmers' faces this morning, eastern Nebraska. I haven't heard a lot of amounts, uh, but there's pretty good general rain, which, uh, as you say, is pretty unusual for this time of year. Something that we really haven't seen in the last three or four years here in the eastern third of the state. But uh, you know, crop conditions. Um, Unbelievable how we got out of that drought monitor this spring yeah. and early summer. Uh, I had here on my farm 23 inches of rain from April 1st to July 4th. And, uh, you know, through the rest of July, it was some showers, but nothing uh, major. So we're really needing some rain. And, and uh, we were living off subsoil, lower temperatures yeah. and high humidities uh, due every morning until we're starting to get some August rains here. So I think we have a lot of potential, and as Senator Grassley said, uh, these showers do wonders for filling out beans, making that pod development and those seed sizes bigger. Yeah, yep, absolutely. It seems to be coming along. Um, I I know that you're a bean producer, Greg, but USDA's got a record na- uh, record state yield in for Nebraska at 195 bushels per acre. Does that make sense to you? For corn, yeah, you know. <laughs> Well, corn huskers know how to grow corn, and uh, oh, yeah. a lot of it's pivot irrigated. So, so we'll we'll see. I think uh, it 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 could probably stretch that high, uh, mm-hmm. which, which would be pretty incredible. Uh, but uh, it'll kind of depend on grain fill here as we as we you know fill out test weights and all those type of things really put into play for corn. But uh, the crop got in a little bit late. You know, we had like a two-week rain delay for over the most of the eastern third of the state there, late April, early May, right at prime planting season for both corn and beans, actually. And But I think it made it up. I, I saw corn that grew as fast as I've ever have seen uh, once it, it started shooting up there uh, after those June rains, and it just really took off. So I don't really? think we're behind all that much. Okay. All right. Very good. Uh, I know you've been out in the bean crop, uh, putting on a good number of pods. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm liking what I'm seeing. Um, my niece and I went out over the weekend and, and looked at fields and uh, did some scouting. I, I'm really encouraged. There's really no insect pressure, and in, 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 at least good. in my area, which is which is really good for both corn and beans. And so uh, that helps. Um, these. Uh, Cooler uh, days certainly help so that the crop isn't under stress while we wait for that next rain. And so, yeah, uh, August will tell. I'm anxious to see what your crop tour, uh, what you find there when you come yep. through Nebraska. I think you'll you'll find a pretty good crop. But uh, and you know, uh, a few days away, uh, we'll we'll see uh, even more uh, more accurately what this bean crop will be. All right, all right, stay right there, Greg Mitchell Hora down in Southeast Iowa. Mitchell, welcome back. Uh, did you pick up a rain this morning? Always good to chat here, Chip. Um, it looks like it's falling apart right as it's hitting the farm. Um, I'm in the office here today, uh, so I'll get the full report here later on. There's still a chance uh, some more coming through. We'd take a little shot. We're sitting pretty good down here in southeast Iowa, though, but a little shot of rain would be awesome. Well, yeah, it'd certainly help that bean crop out, no question about it. Uh uh, what about corn? USDA, I, I asked Greg this question on Nebraska. Uh, USDA came with a record yield for the state of Iowa, 209 bushels per acre. Does that seem like it's in reach? Absolutely. Yeah, there's <laughs> a lot of good corn out there. The only stuff I've seen that where the toughest spot in the state that I've seen is way up in northwest Iowa where you got some of that you know, early season flooding that occurred up there. So they've got some, some rough areas, but 
for the most part, there's a lot of corn going to come okay. through Iowa as long as we can finish out all right and uh, hopefully things power through to the end. Right, right. Okay. Uh, Mitchell, you've got your finger on the pulse of uh, regenerative farming and and uh, low-carbon farming. What's the vibe that you're picking up from growers? How much interest is there in adjusting production practices to lower that carbon intensity score? Yeah, there's tremendous interest, at least in looking into carbon intensity. And if farmers uh, are hearing about this for the first time, you need to look into carbon intensity. You need to look into the 45Z tax credit. Um, it could have major implications for our 2024 corn production uh, and soybeans, especially that going to biofuels, which is a lot of it. But um, I think a lot of farmers looking at, you know, understanding how they can lower their CI score, adopt practices like reducing tillage or adding cover crops or change up their fertilizer program. But the big issue is that we need the guidance from the IRS still. Uh, we're still waiting for the final rules. And therefore, there's a lot of uncertainty as to is, if this is really going to work out as good as it, as it looks it could or is it going to fizzle? So we need that guidance and hopefully sooner rather than later so we can make these fall decisions. Yeah. M Mitch, the, the big problem that we've, that I think a lot of producers have got with this is you said it, we're relied not relying on the IRS and the, and the uh, treasury department to tell us what production practices are acceptable. That is leaving guys, kind of scratching their head and wondering if this is something that they want to engage in, isn't it? Well, a couple different things on that. So one, their IRS, uh, this is a tax credit, right? 45Z is a low carbon biofuel producer tax credit for biofuel producers. And about half of their carbon footprint today is from the, the corn or the soybeans. Mm -hmm. What we need is for the IRS and the Department of Energy to come out with the final rules about how to quantify the carbon footprint or the carbon intensity of the grain. And today they believe that U.S. farmers have a CI score of around a 29.1 as a default. But at Continuum Ag, we've scored over 300 million bushels and found the average farmer to actually be 11.1, significantly lower carbon footprint than what we're given credit for. So in my mind, we actually have a great story to tell about low carbon um, ag production, low carbon biofuels, and help to avoid uh, any potential regulation that could come down the road. Cool, cool. We're, I, I will uh, make contact, and we'll talk more about that, Mitchell, because that's a story that we do need to get out there. Greg, the 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 use of – Greg's very involved with the, the uh, Clean Fuels Alliance uh, America, and we've – Soybeans have got a great story to tell already, don't they? Well, we do. We we sometimes lose these these stories amidst the headwinds and the growing pains of the industry. But nationally, we are now at nine percent of the diesel pool in the whole United States of America, which is pretty incredible. Uh, just mm -hmm. thinking a few years ago, just uh, being a niche market, you know, and now we're mainstream. So. Uh, the fact that I like to, to really uh, wave the flag on is that we're using over a billion pounds of soybean oil per month in the production of biodiesel and renewable diesel. And, and that's, a, that's a huge story to tell. And that's, that's been happening yeah. for several months in a row now. Yep, yep, yep. Okay. It's a great story to tell. We're going to tell more of it when we come back. Also, guys, what is your level of farm bill frustration? Is it a big deal that we're not getting this done, or does it really not have an impact on your day-to-day -day operations? We'll talk about that on the Farmer Forum next. On your favorite radio station or your preferred digital device, AgriTalk is live every weekday. Welcome back to AgriTalk and the Farmer Forum. We're in the middle of it right now in a conversation with Greg Anderson from East Central Nebraska and Mitchell Hora from Southeast Iowa. Greg, I'll start with you. How big of a deal is it that the farm bill keeps getting pushed back? Well, to be honest with you, Chip, I don't think about it day after day. However, right. it is a big, big deal to me. Um, you know, as I think about this, Every farm bill that, when it comes up uh, 
as, as termination and sometimes it is, it's extended and then and you ultimately get a bill. There are less and less people in Congress um, that have ever voted on a bill like our right. bill. Uh, we have a higher percentage of senators and congressmen like every every cycle that have not voted on a farm bill before and they need to be educated and we need we need more uh, farm champions in there I think of the, the state level when it comes to governors and so forth we have we have our farmer governors like Governor Pillen here in Nebraska who is a farmer Governor Parson in Missouri etc but when it comes to making federal legislation I mean it, it's a big deal um, I believe our Nebraska representatives get it um, they're, they're good advocates for agriculture but that's not true in every state and you, when you put all 50 states together, it's, it is a very, very big deal. Yeah. Yeah. I, if, if nothing else, it, sh- it shows us where agriculture is on the priority list, doesn't it, Mitch? Uh, it, their, their willingness to continue to put this off? Well, I think, you know, they, they need to get it done is my take. And, and on my own farm, I'm, we don't, uh, it, it doesn't impact us that terrible much, but it does impact a tremendous amount of agriculture. The biggest issue, and yeah, how they're prioritizing this is that the farm piece of this is now something like only 16% yeah. of the farm bill is, is actually for the farm. Like there's not much farm left in the farm bill is the, uh, the quote, right? But yep. um, but nonetheless, they need to get it done. This is a big deal, and it, a lot of folks like it is is very important. Get it done. Quit playing games, and uh, with something that's this important like feeding people. Um, so they need to get it done and uh, be able to move on. Um, it, it's just at this point, it's just I don't know. It's almost kind of embarrassing. I think of like how long well, this is taken. Go. And just not a lot of not a lot of momentum being made, I think, and, and not by a lack of try. Especially, you know, I think our at least my you know my senators here in Iowa pushing hard, like they're doing a great job. Our our representatives, like they're doing well, but like at the end of the day, it's like, all right, people, what are we doing? <laughs> like, uh, let's get something done. Yep, yep. Well, and and like I said, it 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 shows us how much attention is being paid to agriculture. And, you know, you guys, when Harris selected Minnesota Governor Walls as her running mate, my initial thought was, okay, look at that. We've got a farm state senator or a farm farm state, someone representing farm states in there to uh, as as the running mate, as vice president uh, running mate. But this is the guy that not that long ago said, you know, outside of Minneapolis, St. Paul, and outside of Duluth, and outside of Mankato, well, it's mostly just cows and rocks out there. I don't, it, Greg. That's doesn't. That's not the message that I want represented from rural America. Well, it, it isn't when we hear statements like that. But you know, um, I, I think people really need to realize that agriculture is still the backbone of America. We we have the, the best food supply in the world. We're we're, we're the best at, at what we do. Uh, we need uh, a bigger voice. And, and like Mitchell said, you know, let's put the farm back in the farm bill. That's uh, uh, otherwise, uh, why call it a farm bill when it's only 16% yep. of, 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 of yep. the legislation? So uh, I, I agree with Senator Grassley's uh, comments. We do need higher support prices. I hope that's a part of it. Yep. Yep. Okay. Mitch, higher support prices, that would help on the safety net. More demand for what we're growing is a better answer. Um, when, yeah. w- w- when you look into the future, what is that answer to increase our demand? Sustainable aviation fuel. Um, you can take one gallon of ethanol, or you can take uh, 1.7 gallons of ethanol and create a gallon of sustainable aviation fuel, but you got to have data to do it. And it's got to be low carbon intensity to do it. I don't, Chip, in the short term, I don't see prices getting a whole lot better. Like we've talked, there's a lot of corn out there going to have a lot of supply i think we uh we need to be prepared that ag economy might not be good here for the coming couple of years and that's why i think you know my angle is still on 45z that we've seen that the average uh value that the farmer can bring to the table would be nearly 200 dollars an acre uh average acre of corn for 45z credit now that's not going to the farmer that's a tax credit for the biofuel producer but farmer should be able to get a cut of it at least 
Yeah. And uh, that, in my mind, is, is the biggest opportunity that we've got in the short term. And But, yeah, we've got to build out some markets in the long term. And we're going to have to find some, some better, more consistent trade partners overseas, I think, too. We're going to have to expand um, and figure some things out. Okay. So lowering the carbon intensity score of the corn crop produced on the production side is your angle. But in your state, Mitch, in my state, uh, the CO2 pipelines are a highly controversial issue, and some people think that that's the answer. What's your take on that? Yeah. So the current uh, CI score of a gallon of ethanol across the country is about a 55, for easy math. A CO2 pipeline reduces that score by about 30 points, cutting the score in nearly half. But of a gallon of ethanol score of 55, 29 of those points is attributed to the corn. Again, mm-hmm. about half. But farmers already today are doing much better than what we are given credit for from the IRS and the Department of Energy. We have a story to tell, and the on-farm reduction can uh, couple with a pipeline or can at least act as a short-term lever that we can pull on to really start decarbonizing and start some money moving. Okay. All right. Greg, hey, buddy, thank you so much for making time for us. Travel safe. Thanks for what you're doing to support uh, biofuels in the state and and across the country, buddy. Thank you, Chip. And globally, jet fuel is 90 billion gallon a year market. So SAF is very important. Very huge market. Mitch, thanks for what you're doing out there and getting the word out. Thank you. Always a pleasure, Chip. All right. That's Greg Anderson from East Central Nebraska. Mitchell Hora. From Southeast Iowa, that wraps up this week's Farmer Forum. Come back this afternoon. We've got a conversation with Craig Turner from Stonex Group here on Agritalk.